Well, hello everybody. Welcome into Great Atmosphere here on February 14th, Valentine's Day of 2024. Wanted to uh, get started by looking at was as usual across the uh, goes goes True Color satellite. Generally speaking, not a lot to uh, talk about here in the uh, contiguous U.S. today. We had a pretty significant uh, major nor'easter snowstorm that quickly hit the uh, northeastern states along I-95 yesterday. Had a little bit of a forecast bust that we'll briefly talk about here uh, coming up, but I just want to take a look at the features. Uh, across the northeast, you can see the result of that snow on the ground from uh, south central PA extending all the way over into the areas near uh, eastern Mass. And then we also are seeing gravity waves come off the Appalachian Mountains as uh, cold air starts to make its way down uh, the north from the northwest down and into the uh, Gulf Stream states into the mid-Atlantic. Uh, we also see a minor troublemaker that is making its way and forming in the Panhandle region. Uh, very, 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 very weak low um, that is going to form. We talked about this a little bit on Monday about a series of perturbations that would start to impact and deliver like mini clipper systems over the Midwest and uh, the Great Lakes regions and into the Northeast going for the majority of the next couple of days, or I should say a few days. Um, and then we have the beginnings of our next atmospheric river event that's going to be impacting the West Coast and already is uh, impacting the West Coast. Uh, generally speaking, it'll do kind of the same thing where that it did last week, where uh, it'll have impacts into the Cascadian Plateau in the north northern California regions before gradually making its way a little bit further south. It does not have the same amount of strength and magnitude due to the fact that we are not going to have the that Fujiwara double revolving around one another low scenario that we had um, that ultimately doubled the amount of induced forcing in the mid-levels that created such an intense amount of precipitation in the upslopes uh, and the upslope flow pattern of the Southern California Basin but uh, still it's going to be it's going to be an event for sure and then we have the beginnings of some of the well we have high pressure that's dominated in the southeast and that's obviously evident from there not being a cloud in the sky for the most part across the area and then we have uh, the beginnings as a high pressure once again slowly starts to move off the off and into the eastern portions of the continent of the continent will start to open up the gulf again and we are are starting to be, see the beginnings of a pretty significant rain event that'll be impacting central texas and east uh, and points eastward into the houston metro region uh, going later into the week and as far as upper level patterns are concerned we see that subtropical uh, jet that's been plaguing the majority of florida and keeping them in the clouds for the majority of the winter uh, has weakened quite considerably it's still there uh, but ultimately does not have a lot of low level support and is just providing a little bit of high cirrus clouds at the moment uh, we can take a look at the water vapor imagery to kind of emulate how um, how much dry air there actually is in this in the atmosphere at the moment. Uh, dry air is most dominant across the desert southwest, uh, the south southern regions off of the plateau, the Rocky Mountain Plateau uh, of Arizona and New Mexico, and into the northern states of Mexico and uh, West Texas, and then very much so in the southeast. Uh, not going to see many clouds with a atmosphere that dry. Uh, we see the significant trough that is currently dipping down and in. Uh, you can see generally speaking with the generalized difluent flow pattern here that it's going in kind of this direction at the moment and the low is going to form here and then it'll start to kind of go in this direction before making its way and do its typical panhandle low uh, setup should be a very fast mover probably won't even dip down that far down into oklahoma i'd say it's probably more of a uh, straight easterly if not or straight um, it goes towards the east if not more northeast uh, from the point of its genesis all the way up and into the midwest uh, as we go further on onto the week. And then obviously we still have that Pineapple Express-esque atmospheric river motion that is uh, making its way off and into the west coast at the moment. Uh, taking a look at what the... Uh, try to quickly analyze what happened here with the um, with the snowfall that impacted the northeast by that nor'easter clipper storm. Uh, so uh, generally speaking, this is a, this is a, a relatively... I want to, I don't want to say it was a bust. I don't want to say it was generally, I don't want to say it was a absolute verification. Uh, but we did, the, the main surprises was the majority of the models, with the exception of the HER, curiously, the HER convective allowing model, um, had this going about 50 miles more towards the north. So that would have been the axis 
that uh, we would ex we were originally expecting to see the most amount of snow, mainly in the Catskills regions of uh, upstate New York and into western Mass, and uh, up, in, up specifically up there in the uh, Poconos region. Uh, it moved a little bit further south, uh, obviously, uh, so we had a lot of people, specifically the DOTs in um, both Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and uh, Long Island. Uh, those were kind of upset uh, in the, at the notion that instead of getting uh, one to maybe three inches of snow, those areas, uh, particularly around the, uh, su the suburban regions around Philadelphia, so uh, Allentown, points westward over to I-82 or I-84. I can't remember where the interstate right there is. Uh, anyway, it's uh, right in the, around the Harrisburg region. Uh, those were effectively fully shut down. And uh, even though that area is accustomed to being able to handle snowstorms like that, when you tell them that it's not going to be anything to write home about, and the roads don't get salted, decision support service uh, oriented weather desks ultimately put out the information that you know, it goes to schools, it goes to, it goes to obviously DOT, it goes to local governments, uh, it goes to fire departments, whether or not they need to increase their staffing, it goes to airports, uh, you know, and a lot of, it, it's a tough, tough job, uh, particularly for that northeastern sector, just because they are sitting right on the edge of the Gulf Stream. So uh, the amount, and obviously uh, with any kind of winter precipitation and snowfall, you just got to be right on that 32 degree marker and it's that's there's no there's no gray area there that's the freezing line so uh you're, a sector, you're essentially forecasting where a one degree difference one to two degree difference in temperature will be uh and then you're you know you're also taking into account uh frontogenetical convergence zones which is even a more intense uh area to uh more intense phenomenon to uh try to forecast you get convective snow banding on the mesoscale uh, on the mesoscale distance uh, orientation, so it's um, it's really really tough. So I think they actually did a good job. My take. People that live there probably will be in disagreement on that, but um, I, I'd say if you want, I'd say the general track here was on pace. Connecticut was always going to get hit. North Jersey was always going to get hit. The Poconos were always going to get hit. Um, it's just where this began, cold air kind of seeped into central PA a lot quicker uh, than was anticipated. And also the gradient uh, of the low pressure system itself tightened quite considerably. Uh, we had the low track was supposed to be about right here. Uh, it turned out to be probably about 100 miles to the south uh, right here. So the ultimately the cold air was able to advect in a lot more efficiently. Additionally, another major factor was we had if this is the low center right here, we had high pressure that was supposed to build in behind this uh, quite rapidly, and that actually didn't. So we were expecting to see a pretty significant high pressure gradient to kind of push this out and um, kind of allow the allow the low to kind of take up the rest of this space, um, and ultimately that would that would expand the wind field uh, and kind of create a little bit more of a northerly component to it. Uh, but the high actually uh, did not form as deeply as the, uh, or the ridge there did not form as deeply as originally thought, uh, which meant that the second that this low got off and into the Gulf Stream, warmer Gulf Stream waters and up and into the higher latitudes, it deepened like crazy and became, I believe the lowest was a 982 millibar low um, was the, was the, lowest uh, pressure sensor pressure reading that I saw at least um, and that's bright and that's and it tightened up quite considerably wind became a significant factor and additionally uh, it wrapped up itself and occluded quite quickly and moved off uh, one of the interesting things about it is that typically these nor'easters take about uh, take about two to three days uh, for them to fully move out uh, this whole system took place within the span of maybe nine to twelve hours so a lot, of, a lot of native New Englanders and whatnot were expecting to be like, oh, we got, we're in the, we're in the thick of it now. We're in our inch, two inch per hour snowfall rates with 30 mile an hour northeasterly winds. Uh, that's, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be done in for a few days. And then by the time dinner time rolls around, um, sun's already coming up. So <laughs> quite an interesting little phenomenon there. Uh, I think they did a pretty good job of forecasting it. And, uh, you know, New York City got its first snow, measurable snowfall in over two years. So, I mean, they, they, you know, hats off. Uh, Hats off to them for uh, finally getting that. But that's it for the, for the snow. Uh, so we'll move forward. 
Uh, one of the main things I wanted to talk about was the amount of dry air that we are expecting over here in the southeast and the eastern seaboard in general. You can see these, this is the precipit uh, precipitable water anomaly, so areas uh, uh, by the euro, by the way. So uh, areas that are in these deep grays, uh, you're experiencing more dry air, less water overall, and a big slice of the atmosphere uh, that is normal. And then the greens would simulate uh, that their model is, model is expecting to see higher amounts of water. Uh, in the atmosphere, which means more moisture, which typically means uh, more potential for uh, rain. So uh, we can see that generally speaking across the southeast, we get uh, generally, you know, not a lot, not a lot of moisture at all. We are still in that seven to ten day uh, pattern shift kind of scenario right now, where you know we'll have or the North Pacific jet, North Pacific jet will extend, create the atmospheric river, and then retract uh, over into the Japanese archipelago. And uh, whenever uh, it extends, we see a whenever it extends often into the west coast. There's usually about a five to seven day lag uh, for that effect to ultimately ultimately make its way over into the southeastern tier of the U.S. And then also vice versa when there's a retraction uh, that usually dries us out, but we don't we have that five to seven day lag. So uh, this uh, for this time period we are experiencing a little bit of that jet retraction that we saw uh, last week from the North Pacific jet as our primary uh, primary forcing mechanism in the upper atmosphere, which we'll definitely see here in a couple minutes. Uh, and then the extension will, uh, extension is currently actively affecting, uh, or will be actively affecting the West Coast, and that'll start to impact us uh, into uh, the weekend coming up, and then before we start to dry out all over again and do the same process that we have been doing. Quite severe, look at that. That's, that's, that's some dry air. Um, and depending on the flow pattern that we see, uh, allergies is going to be a major component of this as well because if we have uh, if we have high pressure that uh, that starts to evict air from the any anywhere from the south right so if we have high pressure sitting like so ish thank you pivotal uh, if we have high pressure sitting like right here and then it starts to evict air in this particular direction these areas are already starting to bloom like with tree pollen. Um, so those areas, you know, it's just, it's very simple. The winds are going to take the pollen and to, even though if we're not in full bloom here in the, in like I'm based in the Charlotte area, um, even if we're not blooming here, we're going to see the ultimate effects of that uh, from the south, depending on the flow. So if we don't want allergies, we want the flow to come from the north, but unfortunately that means uh, we would get colder air and not many people would like cold air if it doesn't mean snow. We'll take a look at the GFS and the euro comparison now quickly taking a look at how the gfs and the euro have done recently uh, this is uh, how accurate they have been by percentile uh, bl uh, the blue denotes the euro's accuracy and the gfs is denoted by red generally speaking the euro has beaten the gfs uh, consistently over the past year ever since its major update uh, in the early parts uh, about this time last year actually uh, so generally when i make it when i look at the uh, gfs euro comparison i mainly look to the right over here which represents the euro and then i look to the gfs to see general confidence uh, so if both of them match i would say okay we have pretty high confidence from our major global models uh, let's make a forecast from there and we can say we have moderate to high confidence in that seven to take seven to ten day range which is where these global models typically uh, do their best work uh, and then uh, conversely, if they are showing something completely different, then I would say, hey, okay, we got some, we got some other major players at large here. Let's start, let's start to look at other teleconnections because uh, even though the euro is saying one thing, the other global model is saying another, and we can't thoroughly discount the GFS. It's, it's not, it's not wholly inaccurate. It's just slightly less accurate than the euro. Uh, so that's, that's, that's at least my forecasting process uh, until the GFS gets another. Uh, another update of some regard. So we'll take a look and uh, so we see our main system that uh, was affecting the northeast has completely tightened up and moved off and into the Nova Scotia, uh, Newfoundland region, Newfoundland, Newfoundland Labrador regions of eastern Canada and then we'll see our next little uh, mini clipper system by way of shortwave troughs that have started to form over into the uh, mid, uh, mid central mid central northern plains and into, and into the Midwest Great Lakes states. Those will begin to affect uh, this is uh, beginning tomorrow. They will make its way over and into the New England regions, uh, going into the beginning parts of the weekend. In addition, that will probably, you can see there's some light snow all around here. Uh, good chance for some good lake effect snow. 
primarily due to the northwesterly component of the winds in addition to the Great Lakes themselves uh, being a primary moisture generator due to the fact, due to the fact that they are still generally ice-free, uh, quite anomalously, uh, <laughs> some uh, most would say, uh, not, not normal that we would see a generally speaking ice, ice-free Great Lakes. I think only about 15 to 20 percent of the total uh, square footage, square area or area of the uh, Great Lakes surface is covered with ice. Usually that's much more in the uh, 75 to 80 at least for this type of year. Um, so then we get another series of shortwave troughs. And remember, as the majority of those troughs start to move off and into the uh, to the northern parts of the Gulf Stream off the coast of Massachusetts, Behind that, we get more successive troughs, and each time that a trough comes down and dips, it'll start to dip lower and lower, and each time that a trough starts to form, it'll start to evict in more and more cold air from the Canadian Plateau. So uh, this time around, you get in central Illinois and central Missouri, you get a little bit more of a wintry precipitation out of the out of the Friday system that's starting to make its way through. Uh, prim once again, we're primarily looking at the Euro here. Good potential for a uh, for some for some. Uh, D.C. area, southern Jersey, Delaware, Chesapeake Bay, uh, Allegheny Mountain snow. As we go into uh, as we go into the weekend, we'll certainly be I'll certainly be taking a look at that just to make sure. Uh, and, and look at this upslope flow. I'm sure a lot of ski resorts and whatnot and over in the southern Appalachians would be uh, quite happy about seeing that. So interesting. And then we also, because of that high pressure that is sitting off the Gulf Stream, we're beginning to open up the Gulf again. But because we have high pressure that is going to begin to dominate over into the central plains, and we have high, high, high pressure that's sitting right here, uh, the flow, generally speaking, is going to be more in this uh, region. Uh, so we're not going to see a lot more in turn, and that's what we saw from the precipitable water anomaly that we saw in an earlier map. Um, that's why it's a very brief, a brief period of uh, precipitation across the mid-Atlantic and the southeastern states before this new ridge of high pressure starts to build in, uh, beginning it into... Uh, the latter parts of the weekend and into next week. Uh, we keep moving forward in time. Uh, same deal, early parts of next week look pretty dry. Let's, um, not a lot to write home about. The only things to consider for the mid, uh, beginning part of next week, according to both of the global models, will be that atmospheric river event that begins to curl up. Major low starts to form on the, uh, in the left exit region of the upper level North Pacific jet and begins to evict in a lot more of that, ap that, uh, that atmospheric river, Pineapple Express, Hawaiian archipelago subtropical moisture uh, up and into the Sierra Nevada, creating a much more significant snowpack. Uh, should see multiple feet of snow out of that for those higher elevations and uh, more more uh, rain for the Central Valley of California as well. We can take a look at what those shortwave troughs looks like at the moment, and uh, those little it, those little perturbations are going to be the main contributors uh, towards our uh, towards the Midwestern snow and uh, Great Lakes snow and into New England going into the beginning parts of uh, going into the beginning parts of this weekend. Uh, those little uh, inundations right or indentations right there are going to be the main power players that will eventually start to deepen and begin to create uh, some hassle and problems. Uh, but we get to see the end result over here. Uh, <laughs> that's the end result of our nor'easters become quite the significant cold core. Uh, not, it's not not tropical. It's a cold, just a very deep cold core low. Uh, as it makes its way and will start to uh, become even more cold as it makes its way to Greenland. Uh, we can take a look at the snow totals that are expected over the next 72 hours, and you can see the majority of it are in the southern Ontario regions of Canada, across the uh, northern Midwest states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, and over into the northern parts of Michigan and into the UP, and then also up and into the upstate of New York primarily, with a general dusting around the majority of the northeastern states, and then also in the, uh, on the westward-facing slopes of the Allegheny Mountains in the northern Appalachians. Uh, in addition, we have anywhere that you see a, a, a large mountain range while also re receiving that upslope flow by way of the uh, of the atmospheric river event. And that will, it, it's a good thing because this area has kind of been hit, in, has, particularly in, in the Dakotas and in Montana, there has been a significant drought that that area has been experiencing this, uh, this, this winter. Uh, so any chance that we can get to get a more significant snowpack built in so their spring is salvaged, it will be a good thing. Now we're going to move on to a little bit. Um, we're going to take a look, a, f a closer look at the uh, at the North Pacific Jet, and by doing that, I also wanted to uh, kind of give kudos to uh, Laura Siasto and Amy Butler. Of I, I can't remember where they're. Specific. I know uh, Laura works out of the Climate Prediction Center, and that's right. Amy works out of the NOAA Chemical Sciences Laboratory. They put it together a very, uh, very. They, they put together a polar vortex blog. They updated about maybe once a month or so. 
Really, really good stuff because it, they, they make it very easy to, easy to digest, uh, for the most part, I would say. And uh, they do a lot of baseball-themed analogies and whatnot in this particular column. But they're essentially saying, um, we get a Polar Vortex doubleheader. Now, you know, last, uh, in January, we had a significant deformation of the Polar Vortex. And by, uh, by that, I mean, uh, you have a Polar Vortex that generally, and we, we want, in a normal Polar Vortex, you have anticyclonic flow or I'm sorry, cyclonic flow, that uh, will start here and make its way and kind of go in this general direction, right? Uh, so not the case in this particular scenario that we're seeing. Uh, the polar vortex is relatively lopsided at the moment. Uh, we have a uh, upper level high and then the polar vortex low is offset over and over Scandinavia and into the Siberian regions of Russia. And then we also have our main high that is starting to be dominate and reverse the winds out of the, out of the Arctic region over sitting over the uh, west central Alaskan regions. So, and, and what that does, it creates a jet streak over the central of the Ar central area of the Arctic that works to force all of that cold air and starts to force it down and into the North American subcontinent. Now, it's a little bit tricky just because this area has been, generally speaking, a lot more anomalously warm uh, for this time of year. As I, as I said about the Great Lakes down here, those are still ice free for a reason. It's been, generally speaking, quite warm. So, air mass modifies over time and space and distance so even though it's arctic air that's being advecting in it's going to be interacting with a lot of warm air as it's as it keeps going getting advected or moved or advection just means wind um, generally speaking that just means that uh it, you know even if that flow was coming straight down from the arctic you know, it's, it's still going to change quite a bit and it, it will still have generally speaking mild conditions across the southeast uh, but polar vortex is very important because whenever that Arctic air gets displaced, which it is because when the polar vortex, which is a dominant stratospheric weather pattern that is only really in the northern hemisphere available in the winter, uh, it traps all that cold and dry air uh, that would otherwise be to experience, we would normally experience in winter, and it keeps it all bottled up and in into the Arctic circle. Uh, so when this kind of thing happens, we have that, that we have breakouts. So we have high pressure that sits over Alaska that works to actually get all of that um, air out and about so uh so we have a so according to both of them they have a polar vortex double header and what's interesting about what they what they're saying here is that it's actually quite rare because we had the polar vortex uh actually diverge and uh start to scatter uh, via a sudden stratospheric warming event in mid-january which created our major cold snap that we saw across the country uh so in that particular scenario you know, it's not necessarily unheard of. It's a little bit rare because the, the stratospheric warming occurred from the troposphere level first and worked its way uh, more vertically into the atmosphere, like it warmed the lower levels before we saw an we saw a warming in the uh, stratospheric levels. Uh, that is not the case with this one. It's more of a this one is more typical. Uh, we have the warming sudden suddenly begin to happen in the mid levels, according to them. But what's interesting is the timing. Typically, uh, those certain stratospheric warming events and polar vortex, you know, kind of going lopsided happens on average about once every other year. And in this scenario, it's quite rare because we've had two of them in the same year, not only, but two of them in back to back months, which uh, which is it hasn't happened yet. But that is what all the the, the models are currently forecasting. And that would be quite unprecedented. Uh, it, it, we don't really know what that means per se, uh, but we do know what sudden, stratospher sudden stratospheric warming events do to the polar vortex, and any time that that polar vortex gets all messed up like it is and will be um, going forward, we see a lot of different changes in our pattern, which affects the uh, overall pattern here in the uh, southeastern U.S., so we'll also take a look at the North Pacific jet diagram. Now the jet is currently in an extension phase, so it's over and into the positive horizontal regions of this, and it's going to be making more of that retraction and equatorward shift as you move forward in time over the course of the week. Uh, and that is what is and that is what to, is to be expected. That is what has uh, been our pattern across the North Pacific jet uh, for the majority of the season. Uh, we can take a look at what the North Pacific jet currently looks like. We see that it's extended and currently we're going to be making its way over and into uh, the western regions of the U.S. We see that uh, we see that left exit region flow. If we were to cut this into cut that jet streak into four, we see that the majority of the difluent flow starts to kind of go like this, and the uh, and the low starts to form here, and then 
that's in the low forms because it is cyclonic motion right here. And conversely, uh, same thing happens in the southern half, but it, because it's anticyclonic motion, a high forms here, not a lot of uh, deep convection, I would say, would come from that. Um, generally speaking, though, Difluence Aloft is going to spark something. I don't want to say it's like always a, a home run. It's always the left exit region uh, that starts to create the highest amount of uh, convection in the, at the surface. Uh, the right exit region also does as well, uh, but it's uh, just more pronounced in the left exit. So that's where you see that giant low that will form, and that is what the, uh, that's what we saw in the GFS and the Euro uh, earlier on in the video. Uh, we do get uh, our typical uh, Rex block forming, so we'll have our high over low uh, scenario start to form again. Uh, a little bit of a blocking pattern. Uh, and so uh, generally speaking, what we're, what we're looking at there is we'll see a displacement of the Aleutian. Uh, we'll see that ridge start to make its way up and into Alaska, displacing more of that cold air. And you can see uh, you can see that jet start to form. Now this is an interesting component, and I really want to emphasize this as we go forward. What's been missing um, across this um, across the northern hemisphere for at least three or four weeks now is uh, a polar jet. Now, we'll talk. We'll, we'll, the general rule of thumb when it comes to how the northern hemisphere goes is we have um, we have a subtropical jet, which is what you see right here, and then we'll have a polar jet that goes right here, and that's that kind of makes our deep layers. So we'll have our subtropical jet. We'll have a polar jet, and that separates the Arctic, the polar, and the tropical air. Polar air is not necessarily, I mean, it's kind of a misnomer, I would say. It, it's not air that was, it's more mid-latitudinal air, I'll say. Um, that is that is generally going to create our more mild conditions. Anytime we get south of the subtropical jet uh, is when we'll get more moist and we'll get more warm. And then any time that you get uh, above or you get north of the polar jet is when you get the cold, dry air. Uh, so we have not seen this polar jet uh, really make its way anywhere. Uh, you can see the majority as we if we go back to what it looks like right now. It's not that well pronounced. Uh, this is just an upper level upper level high. Uh, nothing a lot to write home about in that particular area. But if we go forward in time, we can see that as we go forward, you get a little bit. This is, this is interesting. So we get a polar jet that forms in Siberia, and then we go forward into Monday, Tuesday, and you can see there's split flow in the Pacific itself, which is very which is very uh, telling. And look at that. Yeah, split flow, polar vortex starts to come in, and this is very, very important, uh, just by virtue of the fact that if there's a polar if there's a polar jet at all, and that polar jet starts to make its way into the subcontinent subcontinental U.S., anything north of that polar jet wherever it may trough and bend, uh, will experience Arctic air. And any time that Arctic air immediately interacts with uh, more mid-latitudinal or tropical air is where we get uh, significant uh, weather, weather systems, whether it be severe weather or major snowstorms across pretty much anywhere in the U.S. if the, if the energy involved is deep enough. Uh, but we'll get to that. We'll get. We'll continue to talk about that in a second. Actually, no. We'll we'll talk about first the uh, MJO. So the MJO is the Madden Julian Oscillation Index. Uh, generally speaking, it's a big mass glob of tropical convection and moisture that makes its way around the entire world and dictates a lot of the weather patterns that we ultimately see. Now, there's other teleconnections that interact with the MJO, um, like the Indian Ocean Dipole, which separates the Indian Ocean in a western and eastern component. Uh, if it's uh, more positive, then you would expect more a, a more dry and uh, a more dry and uh, mild uh, eastern parts of the Indian Ocean. So parts of the Indonesian archipelago and Australia, uh, you would expect them to be more uh, high and dry. And then uh, conversely, over in the eastern portions of Africa near uh, Mozambique, Somalia, uh, Kenya, uh, those regions uh, across specifically the Sahel regions, uh, those would experience uh, more uh, moisture and vice versa if the IOD was negative. The IOD, generally speaking, is a much more dominant teleconnection. And uh, if it's very in place, like the index level is higher or lower, uh, we would expect the MJO, which is the main tropical convective initiator across the course of the entire, entire world, really, um, to become a lot more pronounced. 
the IO and in this particular, uh, they, so the Climate Prediction Center put out a major presentation. Uh, they do this every week about the MJO, and what they're saying is that as the MJO, as it was going to start making its way over into phases eight and one near the Western uh, Hemisphere International Dateline, and conversely Africa, where the where it restarts essentially, it does not go over South America. Um, we uh, we would expect to see a little bit more of a disturbed pattern over the U.S. Now, it, instead of doing that and going into phase eight and one, it is going uh, more into this null space unit circle right here, which means that the MGO is just kind of doing nothing. It's not really an effect on anything, and other teleconnections will take over. Uh, much in this, in this year, it's mainly El Nino related uh, connections like that, or and but. One of the things that they do note here is that due to a positive uh, Indian Ocean Dipole event this past fall, uh, the analogs that this uh, forecast evolution is based off of might be a little bit more skewed to uh, the right than it actually is. So there is a chance that this is actually supposed to, instead of going into this null space here, should be more back into phases 8 and 1 by uh, some measure of possibility than it otherwise should be. It's just the models are having a hard time varying it just because of that strong anomalous positive IOD event that we experienced earlier in the fall. Uh, and if that's the case, then we would experience a, that, that we would kind of be in store for a... Um, a very happening <laughs> weather pattern here in the uh, eastern seaboard of the U.S. because that is certainly where the MGO needs to be in order for us to get a lot of convective initiation. Um, we can take a look at, let's see, what else do we got here? No, oh, okay, so we want to take a look at the 300 millibar uh, height map for the Euro Ensemble. And uh, we, there's a lot, there's sometimes a lot of uh, dis differentiation between whether or not, hey, you know, for upper level maps, do you look at the 200 millibar map? Do you look at the 300 millibar map? Do you look at the 250? You know, it's kind of semantics. It doesn't really matter. But I mean, if um, if you want to put a rule on it, at least in my opinion, uh, if, if it's the winter time in the northern hemisphere, you know, it's, it's generally a colder atmosphere as a whole. So the atmosphere is going to be more condensed toward the surface. And therefore, you would get a much better understanding of upper level fluid, uh, fluvial dynamics if you look for a lower elevation. Uh, so I would, during the winter, just look for the 300 millibar during the transitional seasons of fall and spring. You look for the 250. And during the summer months where there's more, uh, could, there's more, uh, discrete convection available, I would say I would say use the 200 millibar. So we're going to use the 300 millibar right here, uh, and we can take a look at what that polar jet uh, looks like uh, as it begins to form, and we'll move forward, and forgive forgive me for uh, the slow internet here. So um, we can see that we have the subtropical jet forming, and this is uh, Thursday of next week. Uh, we can see that, that this is the main polar jet, and then we have our subtropical jet. This has not been the case. We've, we've usually just had the, we've had the subtropical jet make its way all the way here and then split and into the, do that atmospheric river high over low pattern. If this polar jet uh, that we see right here uh, makes its way and starts to go maybe like an extension out to here with a jet max right here, uh, we would expect to see uh, southwestern, if we get southwestern flow that kind of dips like this, and we're, if we're here in the southeast, and that uh, and the major flow starts to come from this direction. Oh boy, are we in for a significant weather pattern change? Uh, because if we have the polar jet interacting with subtropical jet from right here, uh, we would get uh, <laughs> if the subtropical jet ever messes with a polar uh, jet and it kind of pinches off the mid latitudinal uh, layer here, and just you'll have Arctic air here and you'll have tropical air here. Uh, what happens when you mix? cold and cold and dry air with warm and moist air and the bigger differentiator between the two you get severe weather and uh depending on where your placement is geographically uh you can you can set yourself up for some major snowstorms as well so uh and we'll take a look at what the uh particular ensemble models look like here so you can see uh as we move forward here this is uh thursday of next week and in these anomalies so we would expect to see in the blues you would expect to see a trough and you expect to see a ridge in the reds. Uh, so we see a good thing. A good thing for us generally, we have high. We have high pressure ridges over the over the Arctic and over Alaska and Greenland that displaces the cold air, which means that anywhere that that high pressure otherwise would be is the invection area for cold air. And then we also have uh, as these two, the boundary between the uh, troughs and the ridges are representative of the jet stream at that level. 
this is at 500 millibar level and mid levels um, that would precipitate a that would precipitate a uh, polar jet extension uh, over into the continental U.S. And uh, one thing that we look for whenever we get that jet, and you can see the jet still exists right over here in southern Alaska, right here. And then uh, where does that pattern leave us? If we have, if we can move this trough blue area more towards right here, and we can keep the general flow line coming from a southwesterly, uh, west southwesterly direction. Uh, as we go, and this is this is way out there in the year ensembles, by the way. So no, by no means is this like a forecast, but this is uh, this is what we look at in terms of trying to predict a more uh, climatological uh, forecast because it's very important in terms of agricultural commodities, plant, planting. Uh, and I know they're already planting down in the deep south just because it's been so warm. So stuff like this is very important. Um, you know we, that there is a possibility that we get some major storms out of this, both winter and severe, uh, other and otherwise. We go into uh, a transitional month here in March. Um, what that means is essentially we're getting a whole lot more solar flux, a lot more solar radiation across the whole of the United States. In the uh, southern tier of the U.S., we're getting uh, by the end of March, we'll have gained a whole another hour of daylight. And up in the northern tier of the U.S., we're going to get two more hours of daylight. So, and all that extra solar radiation definitely uh, serves to create a much more dynamic and convective atmosphere. Uh, the more often that it's exposed to sunlight and the more moisture that it gets by way of the subtropical jet. And anytime that it interacts with a polar vortex that is being lopsided and is not going into its um, end of winter transition, it's still a midwinter um, polar vortex shift. Um, they're two different things. Um, you know, that, that is generally speaking a way that we can get some very interesting and dynamic weather uh, across the southeast. So that is what I'm looking at. Uh, I do appreciate you tuning in today. Once again, my name is Zach for Great Atmosphere. I do appreciate your subscription to the channel. If you particularly live in the southeast, uh, that's obviously where I'm based, and I'll be basing most of my forecasts off of that, but that won't stop me from looking at overall weather patterns that might affect us down the road or just interesting stuff that might be affecting other areas of the country as well. Uh, so I will be doing these forecast videos uh, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, uh, released in the mid-afternoon. And uh, so that means I will see you on Friday for another video. Thanks for tuning in. Take care.